of all the judges in, in the book of Judges. There's still two more judges as we uh, go into uh, to 1 Samuel later. But uh, we've gone through all the judges. Remember those judges that are called deliverers or savior, uh, saviors that God would raise up because Israel is just a, a mess. And uh, they keep falling into sin and, and uh, keep turning to these false gods of these other nations that they were to drive out of, of the promised land. And they failed to do that, so they keep uh, falling into sin, and God has to send a deliverer. Well, we've gone through those, those judges, but there's still more story to be told before we're done with this, this book. And uh, uh, this week, uh, this particular story, it, uh, it reminds me of a good... Uh, uh, TV crime uh, drama, like a, the, as I was reading it, it reminds me of like the introduction to think of you know I don't know CSI or NCIS or what's Blacklist, whatever um, is your favorite uh, uh, TV drama. Uh, imagine this for me, all right? So as, as as we look at this introduction to this story, there's several clues uh, as to what this episode is going to. To be about, and so imagine this: the, the 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 screen fades in, it fades in from black, and there's this there's this Ephraimite, there's this uh, named Micah, this guy named Micah from the the tribe of uh, Ephraim, and he's approaching his mother, and he's like, "Mom, um, I have something to confess to you. You see those eleven hundred uh, pieces of silver that somebody had stole." Uh, stolen from you, and that I that I heard you uh, pronounce a curse over. Well, that was me. I'm the one that uh, that stole that uh, those those coins uh, from you. And you see, Micah is just scared to death because he's very superstitious, and she has pronounced a curse on the person that took this. So he is he's shaking in his boots. And so his mom's answer to him is, "Well, thanks for your honesty." The Lord, the Lord bless you. The Lord uh, be with you. So she is very uh, forgiving. I mean, she's basically telling him, I forgive you. And I, th- I think that's pretty, pretty awesome. That's, that's pretty wonderful of her. And not only that, but she says the, this 1,100 pieces of silver that you took from me and now you've confessed and you've repented and you're giving it back. I am going to dedicate this silver to, to God. That's what I'm going to do. And that's pretty awesome as well. So she's forgiven him, and not only that, she's going to take the silver and she's going to dedicate it to the Lord. And then she says, and I'm also, I'm going to take this silver and I'm going to make a carved image out of it. I'm going to make, a, I'm going to make an idol and I'm going to give that idol to you. So what, <laughs> now, wait, wait, wait a second. She, so she's, she's forgiven him. She says she's going to dedicate it to the Lord. But now she's going to take this money and she's going to make a carved image out of this. I mean, doesn't she know the second commandment? Doesn't she know Exodus 24 that says that God says you're to have no graven images? Meaning what he means is you're to not make anything, any idol out of wood or or clay, or metal, or whatever, and to set it up as a god and bow down to it, and, and that's what she's planning to do. And so we're getting these clues that something is like messed up in, in, in the heart of, of Israel and its people, because this is, like I said, it's the second commandment. This is clearly written in, in Scripture. So that's one clue. One, you see a superstitious people. Two, you see her taking this money and making a graven image. And then the next few verses says that so she takes 200 coins of the silver and she makes, she has these idols made. The next clue is like, what happened to the other 900? She said she was going to dedicate them all and she's only taken 200 of the coins and had them melted and made into these images. So she gives this image to Micah, and Micah, he has this big shrine in his house, and so he puts these images that she made for him, these graven images, he puts them on this shrine. And he also has all these other household gods that he puts up on this this shrine. Yeah, this is an Ephraimite. This is Israel. This isn't like the people of one of those other nations, their enemies. This is the people of Israel. And so he puts it all on the shrine, and then he hangs up an ephod. Remember what an ephod was, it's what the high priest wore, but as we saw earlier in the book of Judges, 
uh, Israel's had a knack for taking these ephods and bowing down and worshiping them uh, as something more than just a garment. It became to them a god in which they worshiped. And so not only that, Micah, he takes all these images, the images she made, his own gods, his ephod, hangs it up in his room on, on, uh, at his shrine, and then he ordains his son as his personal priest. Now, there's a few problems that are going on here. Wrong tribe, wrong family, and wrong location. So all sorts of mess with him ordaining his son as, as his, his personal priest. First of all, the, the, the priests were to, uh, they were to function within the tabernacle, which would later become the temple. There was a location that God had said that they were to, to serve in, and it wasn't to be in the home. You weren't to have your own personal uh, priests. The second thing, these are Ephraimites, all right? The people that were to tend to the tabernacle and the temple were the Levites. They were not of the tribe of, of Levi, all right? And then... Within the tribe of Levi, there was only one family in their lineage that could be priests, and that was the family of Aaron, the descendants of Aaron. So all sorts of things going on wrong. One, we have a thief, though he did confess it because he was afraid of this superstitious curse. He uh, gives the money back. His, his mother says that she's, gonna, uh, she's going to uh, give everything to God, and she only takes a portion, and she makes these graven images. He has this shrine. He puts it all uh, on his shrine with his other gods and this ephod, and then he ordains his son, who has no business being a priest, as his own personal priest. And then the scene fades to black. And the words come across the screen. In those days... There was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And then the intro credits roll. Judges, da 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 <laughs> CSI, whatever. Burger King has this 40-year-old slogan. I think a few years ago they actually changed it. This 40-year-old slogan was, have it your way. For decades it was called, have it your way. Now I think it's uh, something like... Uh, um, be your way or something, which kind of doesn't make sense to me. But anyways, they had this 40-year-old slogan, have it your way, which works really good with burgers because that's the idea is like you can make your burger, although they have their Whopper, you can, you can specialize it any way you want. And I like that idea because I definitely like my burgers my way, the way I want it. In fact, the way I want it has nothing to do with Burger King. It's got to be Whataburger. And no other fast food restaurant compares. And I'm disappointed and I get depressed every time I walk into another fast food restaurant and I decide to try their burgers. I feel depressed because I could be down the street at Whataburger having the best burger in the nation. I'm not kidding. Amen. Thank you. So I like my burgers my way. I like the number four with jalapenos and cheese and mustard, everything on it. Oh, it's so good. But that's not my idol. That's just something I love and I. <laughs> <laughs> Have it your way works great with burgers. Not so much with God. Not so much with God. Israel, they don't even have a king. I mean, they have no leadership. They don't have a king, much less a burger king. <laughs> And God certainly isn't their king at this point, and that's the biggest problem. So, commercial break, comes back to the commercial, and the rest of the episode goes on. So, there's this Levite, the scene changes, right? There's this Levite, he's, he's living in, in uh, Judah, uh, in the town of Bethlehem. Now, I want you to think of these different tribes. Backing up in the story, a man by the name of Jacob, he had 12 sons. And as they had more children and they had children, they grew into these tribes named after these, these sons. And so if you think of the United States, it's kind of like if Texas, you know, that would be one tribe and, and Alabama would be another tribe and New York would be another tribe and Oklahoma and, and so forth. And Bethlehem would be like Houston inside of Texas. So there's this Levite, right, living in Judah uh, at, at Bethlehem. So it's like living in, tech, in Houston, in, 
in, in Texas. But a Levite, the reason he wasn't in a state or a territory, a tribe uh, called uh, Levi, is because they didn't have an allotment. When, they, when God brought them into the promised land, he says, you're going to be in charge of the tabernacle. Uh, my house, you're going to be in charge of that, all of your people, and, and, and instead of you having your own area, I'm going to disperse you amongst the other, the other tribes. And so that's what they did. And so he is living in Bethlehem, though Bethlehem, interesting, uh, interestingly enough, is not one of the allotted cities uh, for the Levites. Some scholars believe that this, uh, this Levite had a, his father was from the tribe of Levi, and maybe his mother was from the tribe of Judah, and therefore he's residing in uh, Bethlehem. So anyways, uh, as an adult, he leaves uh, Bethlehem, and he goes to Ephraim looking for a place to live, make a living, and to serve. Now, some scholars believe that the reason he is having to wander and find a place of living is because Israel is totally messed up. It's in total disarray. And because the tithe in Israel has been neglected, it has left this man and the rest of the Levites in need. So the way that this worked is the Levites served in the temple, right? And they didn't make a living doing all the other things that the other tribes uh, did. They made their living in the temple. So when, when, uh, when people gave up their tithe, right, uh, it, was, it, it was giving. It's just like when we give. It's giving unto the Lord first. But it supported the Levites, so that 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 um, not just money, because a lot of times it, back then it was it was uh, it was cattle and, and, and different things like you know fruits and vegetables, your produce that you would give uh, to the to the Levites for them to partake of, and that's the way they made their living. So when the tithe is neglected, everything begins to crumble. The whole system begins to crumble, and the religious uh, system suffers. Just like if we stop giving. All this suffers, and we can't do. We can't do God's kingdom work the way he, he calls us to do. So here's this man, because times are, are, are rough, and he is looking for a place to serve and to, to live. And he runs across this man by the name of Micah. Remember Micah from our introduction a little while ago? And Micah, with these household gods, you know, he says, hey, stay with me. And be to me a father and a priest. Basically, the word father means like be my pope. They didn't have popes back then, but you know, be my be my pope, be my religious uh, my my religious leader, be my priest, and I will give you ten pieces of silver uh, a year. Man, this guy was a miser because ten pieces of silver a year was nothing. It was nothing, um, and a suit of clothes for your your living, and so. This, this guy is, this priest, he's more than willing. He's excited. He's got a place to serve. The problem is, again, the Levites and the priests, where were, to, where were they to serve? In the tabernacle and in the temple, all right? They weren't to be somebody's personal priest. So he comes in and he replaces this guy's son as the priest. And Micah, he's pumped up and he's like, God is blessing me because I now have a Levite as a priest. This is distorted thinking. It's, it, it's, it's messed up thinking. It would it, be like us, uh, you know, if we had a drug dealer in the church and, and you're going out and you're dealing drugs and you're taking the money and, and you're, you're tithing it to the church, you're giving it to the church, and you're like, yes, the Lord is blessing me because I'm prosperous and it's because I'm giving to the church. And meanwhile, you're out there dealing drugs and being crooked. It's distorted thinking. Scene change. <laughs> and the scene change, the words come across the screen again. In those days, there was no king in Israel. So there's this tribe of Dan. And uh, what had happened was in Joshua, and in the, the book of the law, in, in, in the uh, Old Testament, God is allotting the different territories for people of Israel to inherit. I'm going to take them to the promised land. When they get the promised land, this is going to be for you, Judah. This is uh, going to be for you, uh, Ephraim, and, and so forth. And this is for you, Dan. Well, the problem with the Danites, we see at the beginning of Judges, a lot of these, because they weren't faithful to God, a lot of these uh, these different tribes, they had problems taking their, 
their land <laughs> that the God had, had promised them. And the Danites, it, that was the case for them. And so they hadn't, they hadn't taken all the land that was supposed to belong to them. So the Canaanite, Canaanites were still uh, possessing a lot of this land, and they didn't have enough land to, to live on. And uh, so they weren't able to take uh, their land. So what they're doing now is there's a portion of this tribe that's going out, and they're looking for an easier route than what God had shown them and told them to do. You ever look for an easy way out when God has called you to persevere? Has that ever happened to you? I know, I know it's happened to me. I know it's happened to me. I know God has, has specifically, it's been a faith test, and he's asked me to, to uh, persevere. And, and, and a lot of times we have to wait on the Lord. You know, the, the passage in Isaiah says, wait on the Lord, and, and those who wait on the Lord uh, shall renew their strength. They'll mount up like wings uh, of eagles. But the, what's before that is waiting on the Lord. We think, oh, trust on the Lord. Give me my wings and let me fly. And it doesn't work that way. God says you have to wait. That's what faith is about, is trusting Him. So you're given a waiting period where God wants you to trust Him. And you're looking for every other way out of it. Escapism. My wife knows that I've struggled with that a lot. Escapism. Wanting to get the fastest route out of the situation and take the easy road. We do that. We do that. That's what the Danites are doing. We're not much different than them a lot of times. So from the beginning of our, our introduction, beginning of the story. So they end up staying with Micah. He invites them in and they, these 600 men, he gives them uh, his, his land to, to rest in. And uh, while they're there, they recognize this Levite, his, uh, his dialect. It was, uh, it was different from the other. Uh, uh, no, they, they recognize Levi, uh, or this, this Levite, and they're like, how, how in the world did you get here? What, what, what brought you here? Why are you in this house? And the Levite answers the Danites. He says, well, well, this guy Micah, man, he's a great guy, and he hired me to be his personal priest. Can you believe that? Well, you think the Danites, well, this is, they're about to chastise him. They're about to put him in his place. They go, what in the world are you doing? But they're, not, they're like, no, man, that's cool. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. Would you inquire of the Lord for us? <laughs> would you inquire of the Lord for us so that we know that our venture, us going out to seek this inheritance, that it's going to su succeed? And they say nothing about, you know, the audacity of him trying to be somebody's personal priest in their home. And this Levite, he's like, oh, yeah, I can do that for you. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. In fact, God, God's got it. God's already, he, he said he's got it. It's under the eye of the Lord. But the Bible never says that he actually sought the Lord. He just tells him God's got it. It's good. Go on. So these Danite spies, uh, they, they send five spies to go and scope out this, this land that they're looking to conquer and, and uh, take as their their inheritance. And man, it's this, it's this area called Laish, and the people are unsuspecting, and it is just easy peasy. It's easy pickings for them to, to take. And there's this contrast between uh, them looking at this land and saying, man, we've got this. They're just, they're just, I mean, they're just like so unsuspecting, we can just go in and, and, and take the land. And, and you notice this contrast between when the people of Israel were about to cross into the promised land, and Moses, he sends spies into the land, right? And these spies uh, come back, these 12 spies, and 10 of them are like, my goodness, we're like grasshoppers. These people are giants, and, and there is no way we're going to take this land. And Caleb and Joshua, they're like, what are you guys talking about? Let's trust the Lord. There's no task too difficult for him. Let's go in the power of the Lord and let's, let's conquer. Now here you've got these men who assume that God's got their back and they're not seeking out, you know, what they've already tried un unfaithfully to take the land that God had allotted to them. And now they're at a point they're not believing God and they're looking for the easy route. And so these spies are coming back like, man, this is the sense. We've got this. Let's, let's, let's go at it. You know, the sad thing is that some scholars are not even confident that this is a part of the promised land, that it's on the outskirts of the promised land. You see, when Israel went, in the, went uh, crossed over the Jordan, they're not to just wipe out anybody they see. That wasn't the whole point. It was these, these evil brood of people, right? 
that had uh, just persisted in their, their pagan and disgusting um, ways for centuries. And God says, those are the people that you are going to drive out, and I'm going to give you the land of your enemies. They weren't to just go anywhere and conquer. So it's very likely that these people were just an unsuspecting people that were not a part of the land that God had promised them. Same change. So these, these spies, they go and they pass by uh, Micah's house again. And then they go to the rest of the, the tribe and they're like, hey, did you know that Micah, you know, the, the guy that we stayed at, at, at his house the other day, did you know that he has idols in his house? And he's got this uh, this this ephod that he's that, that he that he's worshiping. Did you know about this? I mean, you need to think about this. What are you what are you going to do about it? And now at this point in the story, you're like, yes, they're about to they're about to make things right, and they're about to uh, rebuke Micah for what he is doing. But no, they don't do that. That's not what they do. They're like, you need to think carefully about what you're going to do. And what do they decide to do? They decide to go in and take his gods. So they march into the house and they collect his gods and they begin to leave. And so this priest chased back and was like, what are you guys doing? What are you guys taking all the gods for? And this is what they tell him. Shut up. Go read in your Bibles. It's not written like shut up, but it says put your hand over your mouth. So they're, they're saying shut up. Join us. You come with us. I mean, think about this. What is better, that, that you're going to be one man's priest? Or you get to be the priest of the whole tribe? Think about it. And man, this priest is pumped. And so he takes these gods and he goes and he joins the tribe of Dan. Now Micah, the owner of the, the, the house, the property, he comes out and he's running after him. And he's like, what in the world are you guys doing? You're taking all of my gods and you're taking my personal priest. I've got nothing left. What a sad state of affairs. This false priest and this false idols is all that this man has. And basically the Danites say, well, why don't you do something about it? You just, you need to shut up too or you might get yourself killed. So just be quiet and go on home. That's basically what they tell him. And so Micah realizes he can't overpower them, and his, he don't have enough people to overpower them, so he sticks his tail between his legs, and he, he goes on home. So the Danites, they go out, and they conquer Laish. Easy pickings. <laughs> it, was a, it was a cinch, nothing to it. And it wasn't because God had their back. It was just these people were unsuspecting, minding their own business. They go in, they conquer and they set up all these idols in the C5, and they bow down, and they worship these gods. And to top it all off, right here at the end of the story, we find out that this Levite priest, he's actually from Moses' family, so he's not even of Aaron's family, and he's functioning as a priest. What a mess the people of Israel are in. In 2 Timothy, Chapter 4, uh, Paul writes to, uh, to his, um, his pupil, uh, Timothy, who was a pastor. He says, Timothy, listen to me. He says, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they're going to gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth, and they're going to turn aside to myths. You know, in, 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 in many regards, in some regards, we're not that far off from the time of the judges. I mean, it, it might not be as, 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 as devastating, the death and all that stuff that we see around us in our, in our uh, civilization, in our society. We have safe walls, most of us. But spiritually, in our hearts, we're not that far off as a society from these people in the book of Judges, from Israel. You see, we want our own brand of God. 
We want to, you know, we're made in the image of God, but yet people want to make God in their own image. They want to take a little bit of this belief and a little bit of this belief and some of this superstitious belief over here, and they want to mix it together and they want to order it with a side of fries and make it their own religion. It doesn't work that way. And we justify things. You know, we've been given new hearts by the Holy Spirit, right? If you've been born again, God has done something in you. But you've got to be careful because also Jeremiah says that our hearts are wicked. So there's kind of, until glory comes, until we're called home and we're made completely whole, which has been declared over us by the blood of Christ, but the, the actual, the reality of it is still being carried out. God is still working and perfecting that image in us. So what we've got to realize when somebody says, follow your heart, you're like, ah, but again, like I said the other week, like kind of like with the, the frosty mini weeds, there's that frosty side and there's that, that wheat side. You're like, oh, my heart is, is being renewed after the image of God, right? Because I'm a born again believer in Jesus Christ, but yet there's still something wicked that is working in me. There's still something that is wanting me to obey those passions. So when we say follow our hearts, we need to be very careful. We need to be, remember a couple weeks ago, consulting our Creator. We need to be consulting Jesus and looking to Him, listening to the Holy Spirit, reading God's Word, and seeing what God has to say. Because instead, what we'll do is we'll, we'll justify things such as unjust divorce, having an affair. Christians will justify their actions in doing these things. And fornication and living with somebody who is not yet your husband or your wife. And stealing, however small or big it may be. And cheating, cheating our taxes, whatever it may be. People justify uh, leaving the church and partaking. I don't need a church. God is, you know, when I go out into the woods and hunt or whatever, that's my, that's my, that's my church. I love God. I love Jesus. I just don't love the, I don't love the church. That's impossible. <laughs> because the church is God's people. He's called us to community. We justify things such as greed, our own greed, for not being givers, not just to the church, but to other people, givers of ourselves, giving, givers of our money, our finances. And we hold it all to ourselves and we justify it. We justify our own selfishness and that has happened from the very beginning, from the moment that Adam and Eve disobeyed God, so there is something infectious, there is a virus that is in every human being. We want to say that, 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 that for me it's not about religion, it's all about relationship, right? We probably said that before. It's all about relationship, but then we go and make religion that is our way to suit us. And really, when we say it's not about religion, it's about relationship, it's about us making God the way we want God to be. We can't do that. We can't do that, church. The whole world is out there claiming that there are many ways, that there are many ways, there's not one way, there's many ways. We cannot afford to do that. When we represent Christ, we can't do that kind of stuff. We can't represent Jesus in that way. There was a man I heard on Twitter, um, one celebrity defending another celebrity because um, um, somebody went through some rough times and this celebrity, this famous celebrity, he tweeted out, hey, I'm, I'm praying for you, I believe in the power of prayer. And apparently some people jumped on him because, you know, which is very true, a lot of times we say we're going to pray for somebody, one, we, we don't do it, but what he was talking about more was that saying that you're going to pray for somebody and you're not willing to do anything about it. And so another celebrity came to his defense and saying, yes, that's true. When we say we're going to pray for somebody, we should be willing to do to help, to physically help in, 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 in some way. He says, but in this case, there's nothing you can do about it. You just need to pray. <laughs> you need to pray. He says, I believe in the power of, of prayer, and I need prayer to na navigate my life. And I'm Yes, this is awesome. This is good stuff. And then I'm, I'm flipping through the little slide, you know, it has the little quotes. And, and then I go to the next one and it says, 
But your navigation may look different than mine. And, and the way you navigate through life is, is what, you know, whatever, whatever suits you. I'm like, no. No. And that's that's the bad thing, with, man, with 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 our society and our culture, there's been a lot of good coming out of it with allowing. I know, like in faith walking, you hear me uh, talk a lot about that. Is, is you're learning what's your responsibility and what is other people's responsibility. And so I've learned a lot about like, hey, people are going to make their choices. You know, I can speak Christ into their life, and they're going to make their own choices. And that's not my burden, and my anxiety, and my responsibility to take on. That's their responsibility. You know, my responsibility is just to speak the truth and and love and to, and to say. Uh, what is what is so, you know? And so that's that's good, that's great. But then we we take it to such an extreme where we where we start saying, hey, you know, for me it's Jesus, you know, for me it's prayer. But man, you you find your own way, you find your own way to navigate this life. And no, that's so wrong. And man, Christians, that should never come across our lips. It should never come across our lips because this thing isn't an option. It's not an opinion. Jesus Christ was flesh and blood. It was God's spirit who came and became a man. The very son of God, truth, reality, historical figure. This God man came to earth and took our sins upon him to deliver you from this this, this virus. So man, we can't just pick and choose. We can't have it our way. If we claim that God is king, there's only one way. And his name is Jesus. He's the only way. And I'll never stop preaching that. Jesus is the only way. Not just in name, but in who he is. That's important. You know, because there's songs out there, just cry out Jesus. If you need this, you don't know what else to say, just cry out Jesus. Yeah, that's beautiful. Because that's a powerful name. But the Jesus of the Mormons... The Jesus of the Jehovah's Witnesses? Or the Jesus of the one true God that is revealed in Scripture? You got that Jesus? Yeah, cry out Jesus. Cry out Jesus when you don't know what to pray. When you don't know what to do. And God's got it. Worship team, come on up. Are you making the way of Jesus your way? That's the uh, that's the question this morning. Are you making the way of Jesus your way? Sounds like an easy answer on the surface, but but uh, the Apostle John he says First John chapter one. He says this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light. And in God, there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with God, and yet we walk in darkness, listen to this, we lie and do not live out the truth. In the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood from all sin. You see, if we claim to be in the light, we claim to have Jesus, to escape hell, Jesus. I mean, this isn't a message about perfectionism. None of us are perfect. None of us have escaped sin. In fact, he says if we claim to be without sin, the very next verse, chapter 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So one is saying walk in the light, right? All right, Christians, we are to walk in the light intentionally purposefully live out Jesus in our lives on purpose, not by accident. Grace isn't by accident. He fills us with the spirit of himself. He gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit to enable us, to empower us, to follow the way of Jesus. But then he goes on to say, but if we claim to be without sin, verse 8, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And in verse 9, here's the beauty of the gospel. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. He 
is just. And he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Not by anything you do, but by that free gift. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not. What might you need to confess today? As we go into worship, how can you meet with God? What is the Holy Spirit speaking to you this morning? What do you what is he asking you to turn around? He's a good God, and I'll tell you what, he loves you. He loves you so much. <laughs> and he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins. He's already paid the penalty. We're in a relationship here, right? It's not all about religion. We're in a relationship with the living God. His name is Jesus. Whatever the Holy Spirit, because that's his job, he will work in that conviction in you, confess it to God so that you can put it behind you and you can move forward. Amen. Let me pray for us.